Um, this time, we're going to be talking about talent. And obviously, uh, what's, you know, what, what is the future talent that is required in, in a future organization? Um, I'm very, very pleased to welcome a fellow Brit, Matt Matthew Haynes, Associate Director, Supply Chain, Morgan Phillips Executive Search. Um, and alongside Matthew is Wilson Chong, um, a native of Hong Kong. And Wilson is the chief consultant, Very Lucky Japan, KK Limited. Um, they're going to be talking about building a powerful supply chain organization with local talent. Um, first of all, of course, uh, Wilson and myself share a, a number of things in common, uh, but we're both uh, Manchester United fans. Give me five, yeah. Very cool. Um, on the other hand, um, ladies and gentlemen, I have just found the only Crystal Palace fan here in Hong Kong, and that is Matthew. So, Matthew, Wilson, it's all yours. Fantastic. So, look, thank you for everybody for taking the time to have a listen to us today. Yeah. Um, so, as introduced, I work for Morgan Phillips. We're an executive search firm um, for basically... I would say I specialize in supply chain, but we have other disciplines as well, including sales and marketing, human resources. Um, Wilson? Yes, my name is Wilson, Wilson Chan from Veracity Japan Limited. I um, work for a um, Japanese R&D uh, funding company in Japan. Okay, and what are you R&D into? Um, in AI, especially on IoT and robots. Okay, very topical. And yes. uh, tell us about your, your life before that. Well, I've been uh, spent about the last 20 years in Asia, particularly in China, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea, you know, um, some business operations to manufacturing size. Okay. Yeah, and um, basically um, in China basis, for the last 15 years, we have um, um, business operations, uh, manufacturing. We definitely require the multiple uh, language skill and culture in order to bring uh, establish uh, business operations and manufacturing. So give us a bit of a timeline. Tell us about you know, where you've come from. Yes, and this, and basically at uh, 2003, um, Chinese government had running a campaign. They hopefully bring the overseas experienced people, bring back, you know, to build up their multicultures and language, able to build foundations. So in 2003, China was actually putting adverts on television. Yeah, some sort of advertisement, you know, and uh, some sort of news through the uh, media, you know. Okay. Yeah, asking the overseas education, uh, Chinese students right. came back to China to help to build the country. Okay, so yes. come home, make us great. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. And uh, times have gone long ago, in uh, 2005, we see more this kind of uh, skillful people came up, you know, help to build the foundations. And uh, since the 10 years, about 2013, now basically this kind of very common things right now. And so 2013, Multilingual or bilingual individuals were relatively common. Yes, yes. Okay. And, and the foundations are built really well. As you can see, Apple iPhones made in China, you know, and there's a lot of different kind of a, a brand, you know, has specific from China executed to Western cultures in the okay. market. So where does that put us today? What does 2017 look like? Actually, um, since 2014, 15, 16, 17, for the last four years, I have some difficulty time to um, facing keeping the staff in the same role, in the same company. The thing is, um, there is too much of opportunity out there, you know? And this is, when now we're looking for is people are passionate for the job, what they're doing. And most of all, is royalty is very important. OK. And yes. So loyalty, which is one of the key things I think we've built our conversation around today is talking about loyalty. Exactly. And look, I, I think it was, we had a, a conversation about which way do we take this presentation do we talk about the future skills that are required or do we talk about something which is probably going to be um, across the board for everybody here because I think everyone's going to have slightly different supply chain organizations. If there's one thing I've learned as a recruiter is every company is absolutely different. Um, so I, I think it was safer for us to go this way and talk a bit more about attraction, uh, which is obviously a key tenant, um, development and retention and culture of an organization, which all ultimately builds towards that loyalty piece of what we're going to talk about. So we'll start with attraction. Um, so one of the key things um, we've got in here is social media versus traditional media. Um, look, everyone talks about social media, fantastic. It's true. It is the future, potentially. Um, it will evolve. LinkedIn is what it is today. You know, who knows what it will be tomorrow. Um, but there is also still a space for traditional media. 
uh, you know, if you're recruiting for certain types of role, um, I don't know what you think on this, but definitely, you know, print advertisement is going to be the best way to go um, versus, say, putting an advert on LinkedIn. If you're looking for a CFO, maybe the Sunday Times is better than LinkedIn. Um, <clears throat> job title flexibility was another key thing here as well in terms of a one-size-fits-all global approach to job titles um, doesn't really work. Um, I'm sure you may or may not be aware of this, but, um, you know, one of the key things that you know, we've discussed as well in this is that across Asia, you know, people are driven by different things in different countries. So, for example, in China... Well, basically, people just look at the fact is the pay, you know. That's very important you okay. know, for them. As in, um, in Taiwan and Hong Kong, I mean, the title is very important, you know. So, uh, they want to see that title is uh, empowered and suitable for the organizations, you know. And uh, as Japan, is basically, um, title is... It's always only the senior and junior that's this, you know. So, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, I think having that flexibility around that as an organization, um, you know, can be very powerful um, if permitted. Now, growth. I think we're talking about this from several different perspectives. Um, but what are your thoughts around the growth piece, Wilson? Um, definitely, um, especially on the high tech, um, you know, business sectors right now. We're looking for uh, young staff, definitely. They want to know if this company is going to be a public listing for the next three years. So if you want to attract some of the uh, great talent of uh, technical people, uh, we, we have to give them, oh, this is, uh, we have a plan, it's going to be the listing in public for two or three years. Okay. So they're willing to join us. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, look, I totally agree with this. I think growth can be tangible in terms of this is our goal, we are going to be listing or we are doing X projects. Or it can be just visionary growth. This is where we want to go. This is how we're going there. And this is the roadmap that we've developed in order to achieve this. So, you know, having that very clear picture in your mind when you do walk in to meet a candidate for the first time or the, the 15th time, you know, it's really, really important in that, in that attraction. Because don't just assume because of the brand, people will want to work for you or, you yeah. know, because of your title, who you may be. Um, you know, people may not know your brand. And um, secondly, they may not know who you are. So yeah, it's particularly high tech, just like a merchant Silicon Valley. People start very startup, small company, but they see the potential growth of the company strategy and roadmap. Mm. They would like to join in, you know, yeah. as a passion growth for the job and grow on. You know. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about culture next, um, which are, you know is obviously a key thing for every organisation. Um, one of the things we, we we debated around was respect. And that was, you know, how you demonstrate respect for employees across the board. Um, I know, obviously, you know, most organisations are, you know, have a hierarchy, uh, but nevertheless, being able to represent, sorry, speak to, I should say, individuals who could be a cleaner, um, all the way through to the CEO, you know, always having the same level of respect for the yes. individual in the organisation. Yes, I mean, after right now, information travelling so fast, you know, we can right. hear different kind of news from every every second. Right. Um, particularly in Asia, I mean, China, um, multicultural is one of the key elements you live in in organizations, you know. You have to be open mind, you know, open to share your yes. experience, you know. It doesn't mean you're CEO or janitor. We're just willing to share and respect each other, yes. Totally agree. Um, and on that, we've got finding um, ways to getting to know people inside and outside of work. So you're demonstrating that cultural sensitivity, around them as an individual and who they are, understanding who they may be and what their drivers are. Because I think um, it's on this, there's that whole Maslow thing around the everyone's got a different hierarchy of needs. And I think we always assume that our hierarchy of needs is the same as the individual sitting next to us or the person that's in our team. But the truth is, that's not the case. Um, and everybody's slightly different. So if we can all sort of get connected to each other in that sense, then you know, there's easier ways of, of making you know, a really successful culture. Exactly. Um, what do you think about this last one, Wilson? Empowering employees to guide team slash organizational culture in a positive manner. Well, I, I think definitely um, that's one of the um, matters of the um, we have to throw in the different type of projects to understand people different ability and different type of the experience they can bring in because. Now it's very really important is to identify the staff. Are they passionate for the job? Is it what they like to do? So many of the project will have to be localizations to discover that kind of skill and able to bring it to the company and success for the goal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
couldn't agree more. I think you need to get people involved. Uh, like just an example from my organisation, yes. um, each individual is given an individual project around. Um, you know, it could be CSR, it could be um, you know, head of the drinking committee, it could be anything. Um, but the point being is that that person then feels that they can um, actually positively impact the culture of the organisation through what they organise. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a very, very good sort of project. Um, retention and development. So there's a few really sort of topical points here. Um, continuous hiring of expatriates into senior roles over locals indicates there's a glass ceiling. What are your thoughts? For me, I look at it and I... Because I see this a number of times where there are really, really good local people in certain key roles. Um, and the reason why they, they, they end up coming to people like myself is because they feel like there is no opportunity to progress. So it kind of leads very nicely into the second point of clearing non-ambiguous career paths. So actually giving people upfront ideas. It doesn't have to be concrete, but just a vision of where you see their role going in the organization uh, and within the team as well. So you know, I think a really clear roadmap for people is, is just vital. Um, doesn't matter where they are in the organization or what level they're at. Uh, you know, all, most people feel the same way about this. Well, uh, that's one thing is, is the whole process is building the trust. How can we build up from people we're hiding from the first month, you know, keep going in development, and different types of projects and cross department to understand each other. So this way, we can build a trust that we can empower to localize our key to the local staff for localization and execution. I think mean, this is the very important that the, I mean, the uh, organizations have to give in time for building up the team. I mean, that's the whole thing to build the trust. Yeah. Time is the really important matters. I can agree, trust. And, and with that, then, on the last point here, empowering and trusting people to make decisions at a local level. Yeah, this is exactly um, what we were talking about before. I mean, to identify a project for different type of ability people the skill set to see this kind of outcome we're able to success or not yeah. So yeah this is the main thing that the corporate should have in enough the resource and time for them to executions for this part and this way we can identify a senior role what kind of combinations of different kind of culture to bring in this as a, a successful outcome yes and I think this as well people will make mistakes um, which is I think one of the key things you know when you empower people to make decisions to run projects, mistakes will be made, projects will go awry, but nevertheless, people will learn, they will get better, and you will empower them, which is what we're coming back to. Yes. So, a few other ways to build for loyalty. Um, you know, within a company, um, I think one of the key things is, you know, the values proposition. I think it's quite interesting. A lot of organizations set their values out quite earlier on, but never actually evolve those values, any latter point. Um, so, you know, whether it's you just have a set of values which you think are important for certain key roles within your organization and this is the behaviors that you're expecting from those people, or whether it's a, you know, a reshuffle of that from an organizational level, but the values has got to be a living, breathing thing. You know, when you're interviewing people, are you actually using your values for your core competencies? Are you looking at your values in the people that are within your existing organization? How does that all align? And, then do you start to see obvious deficits and, and gaps in terms of where you're at? Um, so I think that's you know, so important. Um, in terms of the role, uh, we discuss this a lot about the passion for the role. Exactly. So uh, basically, um, right now, because there's so many opportunities out there right there, if we, have to identif if we don't identify a staff that is passionate for the, what they're doing for the role, it's difficult to keep them you know, in the same position, in the same place. To win in the strategy for the company is have the same goal. That's very important. I mm. mean, just like I'm loving my job. Before I have uh, do my RC business for hobby and drawing an RC car, that's what I like to do. And that's why we become the world champions brand. And this is because something that I like to do. Same thing where my team, I wanted something that is passion for the role, for the job. And sometimes we have to take time to discover about that. But when this kind of uh, major element is key, we have a success story to execute out there throughout the world. Fantastic. Actually, Wilson's being very modest. One thing he hasn't mentioned was that his organization, 2007 and 2008, actually won the World Championship for RC? Yes, for the radio control cars. So yeah. that's the first Asia brand ever in, 
in the history. So we did it for two years, 2008 and 2010. Fantastic. Yeah. So there you go. So, <laughs> um, you know, obviously you clearly got people involved and, and, and motivated at the right level. Yeah. And then we put people as the last one. Um, and what that's talking about is, again, it is deferring back to the culture because culture is everything ultimately. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, once you've got your people engaged um, and that you, you are living your values in that sense, you know, the people will follow uh, naturally and people will want to talk about your organization in a positive way because they're your biggest people, they're the biggest pusher of your brand as your employees. If they can talk positively about what you're doing as a company, other people will listen, whether they know that or not, subconsciously or consciously and they will naturally talk positively about you. So, you know, really getting people involved uh, and truly giving them a sense of purpose in what they're doing, you'll naturally build loyalty. Exactly. Fantastic. So I think that's us for today. So... Um, Matthew, hold on. <laughs> hold on for one moment. I think it's about time for a polling question. Just to see if you're awake. I know you are. Uh, so I've, I've just got a couple... Of, of final polling questions. So I want to put up, so Isaac, let's put up the polling question. So how about this? What is the most important role in the sourcing company of the future? Is it chief innovation officer? What do you think? Is it chief data officer? Director for global sourcing? Director for supply chain and logistics? We don't know yet. It will be a completely new role. So again, if I can ask you to get out your mobile phones. Let's just play that soothing music. Thank you, boys. <laughs> OK, so if I can ask everybody. It's very easy. Just get on your phones. The last one. So what do we think? Is it? So what do we think? Chief Innovation Officer, Chief Data Officer, Director Global Sourcing, Director Supply Chain Logistics. We just don't know. What do we think, ladies and gentlemen? Matthew, what do you think? You're our executive recruitment specialist. What, what would you do? Where, where would you go? We don't know yet. It will be a completely new role. Mm. Good. Wilson, how about yourself? I agree, definitely. Really? Yes. Completely new role? Because the information travels so fast right now, think doesn't last, and this is the way to go, to find something, to discover something new. OK. Wow. So both of our experts are saying, we don't know yet. We expect to see a completely new role. Isaac, can we put up the, uh, the results? Have we got the results? OK. Well, you know what? That's interesting. That is interesting, because we don't know yet. But Chief Innovation Officer has just edged out we don't know yet. OK, perhaps I should vote. <laughs> Maybe I could change it. OK, that's cool. Um, any views on that, Matthew? Yeah, look, I, I look at the Chief Innovation Officer, and that would have been my second choice. Um, you know, I, I suppose in many senses, how many, just quick, curiously, how many companies here have a CIO, Chief Innovation Officer? Could you put your hands up higher for me? So it's just one. Well, it's only what, one, two, two? Two. Really? Three. Three? We have, uh, I, have, I mean, I have Edge, my boss, who's <laughs> head of innovation. So maybe three, four. OK. Four. And that's out of, what, maybe 150 companies or something represented? Today? Yeah, there's, I think there's certainly over 200 plus executives here. Yeah. So. Wow. You know, yeah, that tells you a lot. So maybe the, the, you know, that we don't know is potentially the CIO there. Um, but uh, yeah, someone who's going to have to stay on top of technological developments is critical. Yeah, Wilson, how about yourself? I mean, well, looking at that result? Well, that's give the answer. Innovation, that's a term, you know, and uh, we don't know yet. That's why we need a chief innovation officer in you know, order that determines what's coming next, you know, what should we do? So right now, we only have three few companies here. Maybe that's the opening. Some more companies should be hiring more the CIO, you know, to develop what should we do next. Exactly. 
Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Matthew and Wilson. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much.